You wonder. Yes, I see you wonder at me. In the midst of all this holiday cheer and plenty, why I eat and drink so little. <laughs> oh, yes, a host of men have killed themselves with gluttony. But be eaten almost to death by the ravenous feeding of another. You'd think, would you not, that I'd been amongst the cannibals? Why, I have. Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you how I disagreed with something that ate me. My appetite was hereditary. One of the few things I can remember of my mother was a constant complaint that my father used to eat her out of house and home. It was the same when I became a strolling player, wandering the provinces with a down at heels troop of actors. Uh, we were poor as church mice, but it was share and share alike, and they said I ate for four. For all my hearty feeding, I was slim and played Romeo <laughs> very badly. For I loved and was loved by Juliet Cairns, named long ago for Shakespeare's Juliet by her father, the theatre's owner. We dared not show our attachment for very fear of Mr. Cairns' anger. But one night, Shakespeare betrayed us. Carried away by our passion, Juliet and I forgot to act. The audience, entranced, seemed not to breathe. It is my soul that calls upon my name. How silver sweet sound lovers' tongues by night. Like softest music to attending ears. Romeo. My dear. At what o'clock tomorrow shall I send thee? By the hour of nine. I will not fail. Tis twenty years till then. Good night. Good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. <laughs> But misfortune of misfortunes. Old Cairns himself was in the audience that night. The audience thought it was good acting. He knew what he saw. Next morning, the instant he caught sight of me... Mr. Lowcroft, be so good as to step into my office at once, please. Mr. Cairns, sir, I, I, I'm very sorry about last night. Truly, I am. Now, look here, Lowcroft, you're a, you're a good young fella and a, a likely actor. But I can't have you spoiling my Juliet for the stage, so I'm going to put her up without you. But, 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 sir... You get away from here to London and... Uh, Find yourself another engagement. Mr. Cairns, I, I love Juliet. That, Mr. Craft, is the problem. You needn't say goodbye to her, by the way, because I've had it out with her this morning. Tough job it was, too. She even I, but... We... My boy, when Juliet is married, or you get rich or something, why, you see, we shall all be glad to have you back. They all say that there's no work in London. Oh, staff. Oh. Yeah, well, uh... Here. There's, uh... As a week's pay in advance. That's the best I can do. The next few weeks were even worse than I had feared. There was no work in the provinces, and in the theatres of London, not even an extra. One day at noon, after paying the rent, I found myself without a penny, and gnawed by a hunger greater than I'd ever known. Faint and starving, I leaned against a lamppost outside a dining room, where a host of people were... lunching. Hares, fowls, and turkeys were piled high in the window with boundless prodigality among a wealth of carrots, turnips, and cauliflowers. And through the open doors came a perfume more delicious than the sweetest strains of music, accompanied by the torturing voices of diners. Waiter, roast beef with plenty of brown. Oh, yeah, but it's plenty of brown. Roast mutton underdone. I love my mutton underdone. Roast veal and bacon with oh, stuffing. A dish for the gods. Calf's head for two. I could eat calf's head for a dozen. Pudding. Soup. Fish. At that moment, as I was nearly fainting, there came down the street a monstrous old man, bearing before him like the Lord Mayor, a gross and swollen abdomen, walking very slowly as if the exertion might kill him, and leaning upon a thick cane. He had white hair, white whiskers, and a purple face. Indeed, he might have resembled St. Nicholas, except 
for his eyes, flushed with red veins that gave him a wolfish expression. Young man, you look ill. Have you been drinking? No, sir. I, I'm only hungry. Oh, so hungry. Here's a pretty fellow for you. Hungry? The most enviable position a man can be in, and he dares to complain at his luck. Complain? What are the law classes coming to next time, Hunter? This London is a gigantic caravan, full of the most splendid things, things which it only wants an appetite to eat, and he's got that, and he laments. What is the use if you have no money? He's yours. A small appetite is a roll on his head. <laughs> a large one. Large. Huge. <sighs> Born with it. It's very awkward just now. Mm, young man, come with me now and once. But, but Don't sir... Don't talk. Let me interfere with the further growth of your appetite. Walk slowly and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Pushing me down a maze of alleys, he lumbered close behind, muttering to himself with that awful chuckle and grunt. So, what a fine young fellow it is. What room for the development of big woman's art. <laughs> what a backbone for the support of a belly. Heavens, what a diner might be made of this boy, if only he had money. <laughs> Turning into a narrow hidden court, he bent with great difficulty to a little black portal. It seemed to blow into the keyhole with his mouth. What shoulders he has for a table, <laughs> and what legs to put under it now. <sighs> and the door opened. And then... It shut behind us of its own accord. We stood in a large room, resplendent with the light of at least 40 wax candles, in whose shimmer there gleamed a magnificent dining table, set for one. And beside it stood what I then thought was a man. Uh, young sir, permit me to introduce my servant, Boldenay. <laughs> my heart be delight to meet friend of Massa. You have a pretty tasty name, sir. To have a servant black as night and call him Snowball. Boldenay, what do you think of him? Oh, oh, him, a very fine young man, Massa. Got lovely appetite developed. <laughs> he live much longer time than last other young man. <laughs> How much do you think he did tonight? We will try him with a late luncheon first, Golden Ash, and then pronounce on his <laughs> performance. <laughs> Young men do not always come up to their profession. What time? Her mother dying himself. I don't know. Perhaps not till nine o'clock. Perhaps not then. Vanish, Golden Ash, and serve! <laughs> Did the ancient servant go through the floor? Did the table sink when he disappeared and come up loaded with succulent dishes? It seemed so. Food! A banquet! Oh, let me eat! One moment only, a single moment. Tell me again the nature and extent of your appetite, and all oh, be truthful. Our little tongue should never lie for mutton chop or apple pie. You know the him? I've got the devil of an appetite. What is there to lie about? My dear young friend, yours may be fierce at first and promise great things and then end in a miserably small performance. I have no such. Is it a lasting appetite now? Is it steady through a long dinner? Just wait till you see my performance. Uh -huh. I never had a long dinner in my life. But is yours an appetite that recovers itself quickly? <laughs> is it good at all times of day? Unless I wish it were not. Ah, young man. Do not blaspheme. Tell me, if you eat your fill now, it is sharp past four, when do you think you might be ready again? I should say about eight. <laughs> uh, but I might do something like about seven, I can say. <laughs> Right now, I could eat a mountain. Ah, a mountain! 
wonderful are the gifts of providence. My dear young friend, I am very thankful, deeply thankful that I met you. Sit down and let me take the covers off for you. I long to see you eat. I will wait upon you myself, no one else, just we two. <laughs> and the delectables. <laughs> Eggs. He has eaten all six. Oh, turtle soup. Gently, my young friend, gently. Ah, impetuous. Oh, More. Stay, let me add green fat. Juma, <laughs> Juma, your appetite. Don't try it. Oh. Canopy, canopy. Yeah. Sour with cucumber and lobster sauce. Bless me, it's like a dream of fairyland. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like watching Mighty Caesar. Look at him. <laughs> Croquet de volaille, gone like a cloud from the sky. Don't move the food, my friend. Tasty. <laughs> Sweet breads and burgundy wine and mushrooms. Yeah. Smiles of the dear little innocent confiding car. Croquet with it, eh? Moriette's on cast. Larks in baskets. Sweet rapturous singing larks, toothsome cocky yolly larks. <laughs> Eat them up. Bones are all. Here, sir, something. Here, a champagne, hock and soda. Have a dash, Sherry. It's a made-up wine, even the better it. Come, a little champagne. I generally take drop beer, sir, but if you please, a little fizz would be acceptable. Now, oh. my dear old, oh, my palace of Troy. Here's a saddle of mutton with potatoes, cauliflower au gratin, buttered eggplant and gallon jelly. Oh, oh champagne. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth sums of money to see him. Curry chicken with salad and rice and chestnuts. Stop quail. Snipe <laughs> en brochette. <laughs> yes. He takes all three. <laughs> my Alexander, my Goliath of Cats. Where are you going, sir? Plenty of rice, my Napoleon. Here's more. Much more. Now, apricot jelly and cabinet pudding. <laughs> cheese, please. Yes, sir. Like, Glad to have a report with the cheese. Huh? <laughs> oh, oh, King of Bashan. <laughs> Last of all, <laughs> strong bread. Oh. And a teeny. <laughs> Tiny glass of liquor. <laughs> 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 uh, sir, I'm more grateful than I can tell you. And the gratitude. Tell me, do you feel any sense of repletion? Is the blood mounting to your head? Quite free from giddiness, no thickness in the speech. I know, sir. I am, as you see, an ostrich. An ostrich, you say? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's providential, my finding you. Our blessings truly come when we least expect them. Come, to business. Business? Uh, are you perhaps offering me a clerkship in your office, No, sir? no, listen to me. You have no money. In a few hours, you will be hungry again. Mm -hmm. You will feel great pain and suffering greater than is felt by men less largely endowed with a supreme blessing. Appetite. Oh, it's a great trouble to me, sir, when I'm hard up. Why, there, we are agreed already. Uh, let us have no more beating about the bush, young man. I will rid you of this nuisance. I will buy your appetite off. I beg your pardon? <laughs> a strange offer, I, I know. But nothing easier. Read this. I, Luke Lucraft, being of sound mind. How did you know my name? Touch man in your detail. Read on. Do voluntarily and of my own free will and accord agree and promise to. to resign my appetite. Entirely and altogether for the use of Ebenezer Grumbelow from the day and hour of execution of this deed. In return, whereof I agree to a monthly allowance of thirty pounds. Well, what do you say? Oh, 
I, I, I think I should like some time to reflect. Reflect? To what the devil does the boy want to reflect about? Has he got a penny, a friend, or a chance in the whole world? No or never. Archer. Well, I, I, well, I, I accept your offer. Why, there's my brave boy. Bournemouth! You very lucky man, young master. Thank you, my dear sir. But there's no ink. <laughs> he cut me. <laughs> Only tiny prickle, Massa. Just little, little drops of blood on them. So we have no ink handy, dear boy. To sign in copies of your form, the nearest form. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Bullness. Ignorant I feel myself getting hungry already. <laughs> oh, blessed day. <laughs> A huge dinner, Bournemouth, with Curacao punch. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Massa Grumbelo, I think young Massa gonna swoon. <laughs> Just like the lady in the play. <laughs> <laughs> When I came to myself, I was home again, in my squalid little room. On the table lay... A letter? Addressed to me? It was from a firm of solicitors, Crackett and Clarges, dated that evening at half past five, half an hour after I signed the paper stating that they were empowered by a client whose name they never mentioned. Give to Mr. Give me Lucraft the, the sum of thirty pounds monthly to begin this present day. Payment will be made in person to Mr. Lucraft who is requested to call at the firm's offices, 16 Lombard Street, at his earliest convenience. I stared at the letter with a mixture of stupefaction and horror. The monstrous beast, the bargain, were no dream then. How had they got their instructions? The clock struck seven, and slowly, surely, a sensation began to grow in me. A at first a sense of fullness, then repletion, and finally... Of Choking as, as if as if I, I were eating too much. By a kind of awful insight, I knew at once what was going on. The old man was taking his dinner and taking more than was good for me. Soon, oh, soon he began to drink too much as well. Oh my God! I'm getting drunk and I, I haven't touched a drop. My head began to spin. Sugar sweetness, bite of lime and lemon, fumes of alcohol like steam from a volcano filled my throat. He was drinking, gulping the curacao punch. I would run to find him, tear up the agreement, but... His name. I've forgotten the old glutton's name. He's taking his name. Next morning, I woke with my head splitting and my stomach in flames. I hated the sight, the smell, the very taste of food. Forcing down a tiny morsel of breakfast, I went with heavy heart to the solicitors to receive my blood price. Ah, oh, Mr. Lucraft, I thought you would soon come round to us after the letter. Here, sign that. You haven't been long. <laughs> None of them are. May I, may I ask, sir, if you know... I'm not allowed to answer any questions you may put, Mr. Lucraft, nor to ask you any... So take your money and good morning to you. But I have to know... I suppose, like the rest of them, you don't know the name of your benefactor and would like to. Yes. But you needn't ask me. Before you say it, I've orders not to admit you to see either Mr. Clarges or Mr. Crackett. They trouble enough with the last one of you. He broke into their office once, drunk, and laid about him with a poker. Drunk? Oh, God! However, oh, Mr. God. Lucraft, I hope you will be more fortunate than your predecessors. Where are they now? Who are they? Dead and buried they are, all of them. Gone to kingdom come. Oh. Delicious trimmings killed them. Oh, delicious. God forgive you. Poor old gentleman. Your patron, I mean. He's too good for this world, as everybody knows. He did say when the last went off, he would have no more... 
He wept over it and declared that his bounty was always abused. But there never was such a benevolent old chap. I only wish he'd take a fancy to me. What did you say his name was, by the way? Why, if you don't know, I am sure I do not. Here's your cheque, Mr. Lucroft. But I fear there is a blight on the recipients. Oh, indeed. Lord, what a healthy chap Tom Kirby looked when he first came for his checks. Strong as a bull and fresh as a log. A good appetite, had he? No. Couldn't eat anything after a bit. Said he fancied nothing. Oh. Pined away and died oh. in a galloping consumption. Nobody ever saw him drinking, but he was drunk every night like the rest. Went out. In three months. Better luck to you, Mr. Lucroft. From that moment on, I lived in hell. Every day at half past one, the grossness of his heavy feeding weighed me down. But at least at midday, he drank. At night, it was pure horror. His dinner began at seven. At eight, I was gorged and choking. At nine, I was drunk. One morning, I woke up in a police cell with no idea how I'd got there. And on the next, I lost my lodgings. I thought you was a quiet and a sober young man. Never will I trust your good looks again. Me and the lodgers kept awake till two in the morning with you singing and dancing, let alone banging on the floor with the chairs. Mrs. Grogan, I, I swear Not an you hour are... after you wakes up. Not if you was to pray on your knees shall you stay. Neighbours next door threatening the police. And me, a quiet woman for 20 years. I detested food and drink, and I detested life. My bones protruded. My hands began to tremble like a drunkard's. Your check, Mr. Lucroft. Uh, look here, sir. You know, you're going at worse than poor Tom Kirby. What is the good of a fella's drinking himself to death? Your poor old gentleman was here yesterday asking me how you looked and if you continued steady. <laughs> Pull up, old man, and knock it off. Asking how I looked. Oh, why, wager he was. That hardened old voluptuary, that secret murderer, he must have noticed by the falling off of his, my, his splendid appetite, that I was going down. And he was resolved to kill me off by drinking me to death. In my misery, I was determined to forestall him. I prepared to kill myself first. But the next evening at seven, as I sat in my lonely room, awaiting yet another drunken bout, suddenly... Oh my God, what is it? I've never felt like this before. It's gone. Where's the choking feeling? Where's the drunkenness? It, it can't be. It can't be that... that I'm free! Mm. Clark, let me see him. Moderate your language, Mr. Lucroft. This is a solemn moment. It is my melancholy duty to inform you that your patron is dead. I knew it. I knew it. I've been a free man since last night. Look at me. <laughs> I'm cold sober. <laughs> On such a sad occasion, I should certainly hope so, Mr. Lucroft. I have the honour to present our senior partner, Mr. Crackett. Mr. Lucroft, my deepest sympathies. The poor old gentleman is gone at last. Apoplexy. I, I know. I, I didn't understand it at the time, but I felt him. I felt him depart last night. A most affecting sympathy. If you will examine this deed, Mr. Lucraft, you will find that Mr. Grumbelow is as generous to you in death as in life, sir. Grumbelow. That's the name. Grumbelow. Why generous? He has left you 500 pounds in his will, Mr. Lucraft. Look. 500? What for? What is he up to now? An ungrateful turn of phrase, young man. Mr. 
Mr. Gombolo's love for the poor and humble was a byword to all who knew him. He asked nothing but that you care for his aged servant, <laughs> Mr. Boldenez here, and cherish him as if he were your own father. No. No. <laughs> Why, Massa, Boldenez, very good servant. Cook a lovely dinner, make young Massa rich like Massa Grumbelo. I rather... Hire the devil! <laughs> Mr. Lucraft! <laughs> if Massa likes, that can be arranged. I fled that dreadful presence forever. But I had saved a good deal of my monthly payments from the old monster. And my old master, Mr. Cairns, welcomed me back with open arms. And so did his daughter, Julia. I've been a happy man ever since. Except for a certain distaste for the groaning tables of Christmas, as you see. A month after our marriage, I told my darling Julia the whole story. She asked if I took her for a fool. All the same, she has never allowed me the key of the spirit's case. 